Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Thanks for joining me today. 3D printing has come a long way in recent years, and it is the process of making a solid object out of a digital computer file. At Mayo Clinic, 3D printing is used in many areas, both clinical and surgical. For instance, it can help a surgeon plan a course of surgery by producing a model ahead of time. Here to share with us about this today and teach us something is Dr. Jonathan Morris. He is a neuroradiologist here at Mayo. Thanks for being with us, Jay. I know that you run the 3D printing lab here at Mayo. And how widely is this used in medicine and at Mayo Clinic? So we've been 3D printing at Mayo Clinic for about 16 years now. I personally started in 2001, uh, back at the NIH, and over that time period, we basically um, have spread to where we're involved in every surgical subspecialty at Mayo Clinic. So we incorporate uh, many of our surgeons into the planning process of these, and we use radiographic data to make patient-specific either anatomic models for complex surgery, or we use them to make uh, patient-specific osteotomy guides, which are 3D printed objects that we screw on bone or soft tissue um, that only fit that patient and guide saws to the right place at the right angle. So we've spread uh, far and wide since we started. And I think it's because of all the use case scenarios we've been able to prove that this impacts patient care. And that's at Mayo Clinic. Now we also do things for research and education, but we're predominantly a clinical service. So we're a centralized, additive manufacturing, which is another word for 3D printing, hub at Mayo Clinic based in the hospital. So we're not in a department that's off campus. We're not a vendor. We're five flights above the operating room and surgeons and clinicians come on rounds, come during the day with real problems that we solve. And then we do every step of manufacturing in the hospital up into class two sterilizable medical devices. And that's a really big paradigm shift where the hospital is now the manufacturer. And we've grown from borrowing one of engineers' printers um, 16 years ago with uh, Joel Kuhlman, who's one of their engineers who helped us initially with the conjoined twins, um, all the way to making one printer, industrial printer, uh, one room, and then spreading to where now we have 8,000 square feet of manufacturing space that we just opened this year. And we're already expanding 600 square feet more manufacturing space because of uh, some of the COVID stuff we'll talk about. So it's incredibly impactful for Mayo. We do about 2,000 models that impact about 854 patients. Um, that's just clinical care. Uh, and then we do a whole host of other things with it that we'll get into. But as far as wow. nationally and internationally, 3D printing has spread. So most of the top academic uh, healthcare institutions in the country now have some form of additive manufacturing. Several of them we've helped actually set up their shop. We've worked nationally to get uh, IT infrastructure so the 3D printing files can fit inside of the electronic medical record as well as inside of the radiology imaging systems. And we've built a regulatory infrastructure to allow this uh, with the FDA over the past five years by co-sponsoring national meetings. And in doing so, it's become more of the standard of care in certain clinical applications um, to the point where this last year, 2019, we got category three codes approved through the American Medical Association. So we have billing codes for reimbursement for manufactured parts at the point of care. What kind of pictures or images do you use to, to construct the models out of? X-rays, MRIs, what do you use? Because oftentimes we get asked by clinicians can you make a 3D model from this x-ray? To which right now the answer is no. Um, so we typically use cross-sectional thin section imaging, mostly CT, but also volumetric MRI. And sometimes we have to co-register those together. So if you take your average um, pelvic tumor, for example, we'll get a CT scan that has a non-contrast CT scan, a CTA, a CT venogram, and a delayed CT urogram. And from those images, we'll pull out the bone, the artery, the vein, the ureter, the bladder, the tumor, and, and then we'll use the MRI to pull out the lumbosacral plexus, so the critical nervous structures, and then we'll put them all together in a file, and then we'll print that file. So that process is called segmentation, when you develop, when you take the parts of the anatomy out of the imaging you want. So if I just want a spine, and a patient's got a CT of their abdomen and pelvis, well, I have to segment or color in the spine in order to get just the spine. So that process of segmentation happens and we've 
developed numerous protocols in radiology uh, for just 3D printing because it's often just shown the 3D printed object, but in reality, all of those start with a radiology image and the better your input for 3D printing, we do things like dual energy, spectral energy, byte blocks, certain protocols that are just for making 3D printed models. So at Mayo, when a clinician orders through Epic a anatomy modeler guide that triggers a specific radiographic protocol to then be done for that. And then we use those images, either CT, volumetric MRI, and in some case, rotational angiographic data we can use. So those are the workhorses of uh, 3D printing. And when a surgeon gives you a request for anatomic model that they might use for surgical planning, how long is that process from start to finish before you can give them the finished product? Yeah, it's another really good question. And a lot of the answer when it comes to 3D printing is it's going to depend because we have different technologies that do different things. For example, uh, some of our printers print a uh, 10 micron level of accuracy, layer by layer. So each printer, if you can imagine like a CT scan or something that starts with a slice, our printers do the opposite. They slice our 3D file into really thin slices. And then each printer, no matter what technology it is, of which there's seven major ASTM technologies, does the same thing. It makes a layer and either lifts or drops the build volume and does the next layer. So if you want a complete human pelvis with a tumor, with arteries, veins, ureters, bladder, at a 10 micron level of accuracy, it's gonna take about 72 hours. If you just want pelvic bones and you're going to sacrifice and you want a millimeter level of accuracy or two millimeter of accuracy, well, we can probably produce that in under 10 hours using a different technology. So. A photopolymer type technology that's using droplets to, to harden with a photopolymer that's super accurate, that's multicolor, multi material, flexible material, and color. You know, that's where you start getting into the length, the really lengthy builds. Whereas if we want a skull, let's say just take a skull for example, some of our printers can print a skull in two hours, which is really important for trauma. So if we have someone that comes in with a complete facial smash or went through the windshield or fell off their ATV into a tree. And we're going to reconstruct and take all the parts of their fractured bone, put them back together virtually, and then print out a anatomically correct skull for them that the surgeon will then bend all their plates on to make them phenotypically accurate again when they reconstruct their face. Um, we can do that skull in two hours. If we want that skull to be out of biocompatible, sterilizable material, well, that's a different printer with a different material, with a different technology, and it takes about 13 hours. It just depends on what you want, and what level of accuracy you want, and what printer technology you're using. Um, you mentioned several ways that this might be used, and I'm wondering, how does it affect patient care? So do patients get to see these models? I think it would really drive things home for them better than seeing a CT scan or an MRI. I have a real love for patient education and informed consent. In fact, one of my greatest pet peeves, as my fellows will tell you, is a bad informed consent. Um, and I spend a lot of time, as you do, um, talking to patients with a computer screen open, saying, this is you, this is your CT scan, this is your MRI scan, this is one slice of you looking down, this is your right, this is your left. And in essence, I mean, if we're really honest, it's very difficult to understand for the lay person. Most physicians who aren't involved in cross-sectional imaging have a very difficult time understanding imaging. And we're trying to tell a patient who has a severe illness or cancer about their CT scan. I think it's an impossible task. So one of the benefits that we have from 3D printing, and it's not the primary reason we do it, but it certainly is a huge side benefit, um, is that informed consent process happens with the model. So if you take a case that looks like this, um, I'm just showing you a model here of a really large mandible tumor where this tall green lattice structure is the tumor, well, how is a patient gonna understand that on an image, CT or MRI? How are they gonna understand what the risks are, why you might have a stroke, why you might lose function to your hand, why a surgeon has to take a critical nerve? You don't, and the patients essentially trust us to do the best thing we can for them, but it could be better. And we've done some research on informed consent for patients using 3D printed models, and it overwhelmingly uh, is a positive benefit to their care because if you're taking someone's 12-year-old child to the operating room 
and they understand what you're going to do with them. And they understand this is not any bone. This is not a plastic model. This is your daughter's son's seat, uh, spine. This is their scoliotic spine. This is what I'm going to do to this spine. Then they have these aha moments. And then they can ask intelligent questions. I mean, we photographed several patient surgeon interactions with the models and the patients will point to things on the model and say, well, what's this and what's that? And what about this? And, and then they have a sense of understanding and, and it really leads to improved communication. Now, the other side of care, now care is over, surgery is over, a lot of the patients want one. So then it comes back down to cost because we can print things that are made of gypsum powder that are multicolor gypsum powder models that are somewhat fragile that are inexpensive, but still, if we do 75,000 surgeries a year, we can't spend $100 per model giving them away to the patient. So while we'd love to give every patient their model, and sometimes it's such a dramatic surgery that we do, but we just can't do it for everybody. And then from the informed consent, it goes to surgical planning. So there's a, there's a whole field of, of study called haptic perception. So there's the idea that you understand what something is because your whole life you've spent looking at three-dimensional objects and holding them in your hand. And most people can understand CT and MRI in three dimensions. And even if they can and you ask them, well, draw it for me, show me how big that is. Well, as you know, from looking at images, it's as big as whatever screen you put it on. It's, a, it's on your iPhone, it's on a 60 foot monitor at a conference. No one has any concept of size except the surgeon because they have to go in there. So these are life size, patient specific. And when they hold them in their hand, and I'll give you an example. We did a case the other day um, with a thoracic surgeon who's incredibly experienced, really good surgeon, understands imaging. Um, there was a tumor in the trachea and he was gonna have to take it out. He wanted to go through the sternum from the front and we gave him the model and in under you know, a minute, he said, well, we can't go from the front. And he already looked at the CT, he already looked at the MRI, and he was planning on doing a sternotomy, going in from the front. Um, but the great vessels, the way this patient's great vessels were in the aorta, he couldn't have got there. And you can't understand that unless you're holding something in your hand because you have this brainstem moment that just says, I'm looking at it, I understand it now. There's no mental gymnastics I have to do to look at a CTA and a CT scan of the chest and an MRI and a PET study and put all that together in my mind and come up with this object. It's almost impossible. Whereas in under a minute, he changed his surgical approach and was going to do a lateral thoracotomy. And, and when they would have figured that out would have been in the OR. And that's the reality of it. If we could change surgical approach, it happened just last night with the orthopedic case. We gave a very talented orthopedic surgeon the model. And this person is an expert in their field. They're not just learning. They're not fresh out of training. I mean, it helps even more with those people, but this is an expert and he goes, well, I'm not gonna do it this way, I'm gonna do it that way. And, and it was with the, under a minute of having the model in his hand. And I think that level of understanding, if your surgeon is more competent, if your surgeon understands your personal anatomy, not a general anatomy, then, and they can change surgical approaches a fifth of the time, and it shortens your OR time, and you have less morbid outcomes, then it's a huge win. And in cranial maxofacial, I'll use it as an example. If you have to have your jaw removed or a piece of your maxilla removed, we typically either take your fibula, which is a leg bone, or your scapula, which is your shoulder blade, and we saw that into certain pieces and put it in your face. So you have to take the mandible out, it's called a mandibulectomy because there's a cancer there, and we put a leg bone in there because you still need to have a jaw structure. And the way we do that is we segment the images from imaging, we then work with the surgeon when they're available. They don't Skype with an engineer at a company. They come up and we do what's called virtual surgical planning. So they put all the cut planes they want to on the mandible. We then directly transfer all the angles and plan to the leg. All those cut planes are then transferred to the leg bone. And now you have perfect cuts that fit every single time. And we 3D print custom cutting guides that go on the leg bone and the jaw. So not only do we have less time under anesthesia, not only do we have improved outcomes, not only do we have improved bony union to where the bones touch each other so you don't have to go back to surgery, we save an hour and a half in the OR per case. You know, and that's a huge win for the patients because not only do they want to be cancer free, they want to look normal, feel normal. They want to go to the mall, they want to talk on the phone, they want to see their loved ones and they don't look grossly defigured. So, we do a lot of work with the surgeons in plastics, craniomaxofacial, ENT, OMFS, 
to do this type of virtual surgical planning to improve the outcomes of patients that come to Mayo. A picture is worth a thousand words. And so to be able to show a patient rather than just describe something to them, yeah. that's priceless. We do, we have a slide that says a picture's worth a thousand words and a model's worth a thousand pictures. Oh, that's wonderful, I like that. All areas of medicine have been affected by COVID-19, Jay, and I'm wondering, uh, specific to the area that you work in with 3D printing, what have you seen during COVID-19? So we live in, a, in two places. We have one foot in manufacturing because essentially we use industrial additive manufacturing machines to create these um, anatomic models and guides. And then we have one foot in medicine and surgery. And my life straddles both worlds. Um, I could be speaking at a conference that you run, for example, about ablative pain therapies, and the next week be speaking to the Society of Manufacturing Engineering. So what's good about that is when COVID started affecting the Asian countries, we were quickly discussing ways that additive manufacturing, which is a distributed form of manufacturing, could help. Um, and as it was spread through China and went to Singapore and then found its way to Europe, we were already in discussions with supply chain at Mayo. We formed a subgroup, um, our, our clinical service, the Department of Engineering, which has also has multiple industrial 3D printers, including a titanium printer, supply chain, the emergency room, uh, respiratory support, and anesthesia. And our group was responsible for saying, where are our supply chain weaknesses? Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have T-tubes that hook the ventilator up uh, to the patient, and we have T-tubes that need to go on nebulizers. Well, those couldn't be found. You couldn't get them anymore, and we needed 200,000 for the next eight months. So initially, we prototyped them, 3D printed them, cut a mold for them, and then worked with Proto Labs in the Twin Cities to injection mold them, because it doesn't make sense to print them. Throughout Europe though, people were printing attachments to the ventilator. They were printing ventilator splitters, venturi tubes, uh, T-tubes. They were 3D printing attachments to full face uh, diving masks to attack things like Roomba filters too, when we didn't have N95 masks. But we mostly focused on where our weaknesses were, which was PPE. Um, we worked with, we worked with uh, groups in Czechoslovakia that were making masks for NATO that you could put uh, P90 filters on because NATO had a lot of those filters. Uh, the Department of Engineering worked with a filter company in the Twin Cities to create our own N95 filter material because we couldn't source filters from anywhere. And then um, we moved into PAPRs. So PAPR hoods became unavailable and everybody, about 20 to 30% of people fail an N95 test. So we have a, a population of 60,000 employees at Mayo Clinic and 3,000 doctors just from Rochester. So then uh, you can say 20% of those people are gonna need a PAPR hood. Well, we didn't have PAPR hoods. So the Department of Engineering designed a PAPR machine and we designed PAPR hoods. We were talking to people um, that make grain covers for a living that last outbreak produced body bags with their T-bark and we were gonna use them for PAPR hoods. Uh, and then we found 4,000 PAPR hoods that we had to 3D print retro-engineered hookups for because the PAPRs we had didn't meet these. Um, beyond that, we've done a lot of educational stuff. So we've 3D printed, uh, we've 3D printed these COVID swab trainers for uh, the Department of Nursing and because we have all sorts of people that need to swab patients and get to nasopharyngeal tissue. So we 3D printed and created our own swab trainer. So it's not something you buy on the market using 3D printed skulls and nasal cavities and stuff we already did. We did 3D printed a whole host of COVID actual physical models of COVID, both split open and whole, to use to describe to people um, what this was and for lay people and doctor education. And then finally, um, we couldn't get swabs. So Copan is the major manufacturer of swabs in the world. They're an Italian-based country company. As you know, Northern Italy got decimated during the, uh, the high points of COVID. Well, there go all the swabs. So at one point we had 450,000 swabs on order for over two months and none are coming. So the number one accurate test that we have to tell someone whether they're COVID positive or negative, we couldn't get swabs. So the University of Southern Florida and um, Long Island Health invented a 3D printed swab with Form Labs, a company, and they tested it, but it was a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, and 
So we did an IRB test on this, but we really invented our own swab. We thought that middle turbinate swabs, working with the Department of Laboratory Medicine, who are developing home testing kits, was the way to go. So we invented our own, um, we invented our own middle turbinate swab using 3D printing, and then we came up with packaging, sterilization, FDA labels, everything you'd need, leach testing, PCR testing. We did an IRB study with 300 patients uh, that were COVID positive to test our middle turbinate swab versus the only other one on the market, which was made from Copan. And we were equally sensitive uh, and actually preferred the stiffer middle turbinate swab, which we thought was a surprise. So we're gonna start manufacturing 40,000 of those a week just for Mayo Clinic wow. and expansion of our spot. So it sounds um, like you're making- with the Department of Laboratory Medicine, which was Paul Janetto, Bill Maurice, Bobby Pritt, Joseph Yao. I mean, everyone came together, Department of Engineering, us, the institution, allowing our construction to continue when they stopped all construction. So we could manufacture um, all of these things. I mean, we made 30,000 face shields for our staff before Ford had 3,000 off the line because we were ahead of the game because we had one foot in engineering and we could talk to our partners around the world all the way up to where now we're fully manufacturing 40,000 swabs a week for Mayo Clinic. I can see why you need 8,000 square foot of space. Thank you, Jay, for sharing with us today. We've been discussing 3D printing and anatomic modeling with Dr. Jay Morris, a neuroradiologist at Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.